This is an HP News Network special report. Okay, YouTubers and anti-nuke activists, welcome to another HP News Network special report. This is your host, Patrick Penry. Let's dig right in with some FOIA documents. This first one we're going to look at has to do with Unit 4, has to do with filling these spent fuel pools with sand, slurry, lead, sand, slurry, and adding water to them. This is very interesting and very likely what ended up taking place in at least some of these spent fuel pools. They would have put sand, water, and just done the best to cut back the shine and, and emissions. Let me dig right in. I'm starting from page 15, the bottom of page 15. And this is document A109. I'll include a link. You can read the whole document. And I suggest you do read the entire document. Male participant. So what I'll do with this, I'll turn this over to Mike, reactor safety team, and let ask him to evaluate this about the advisability of using sand versus water based on this review. Male participant. Yeah. Male participant. Speak of the devil. Male participant. Speak of the devil. Male participant. Oh, yes. No. That's what I wanted to in Audible, but thank you for inaudible. Parentheses laughter. This is what our colleagues from Naval Reactor sent, David. Okay? And this is about whether you stick sand on it or not. Okay? So for Naval Reactors, is sending him some information about whether you should put sand in these spent fuel pools or not. Later, they'll mention spent fuel pool number four. Just hang in there. This is what our colleagues from Naval Reactors sent David, okay? And this is about whether you stick sand on it or not. Male participant. This is male participant. They had talked to me and said they were going to send us an analysis to say the, you know, sand versus water argument. This is their technical argument about this. And if you read it, it's, I think it's sand. So, but it says sand first and then water. Inaudible. The spent fuel pool bundles with inaudible. Two, Deliver inaudible, poised to prevent criticality. Cooling water is bundled, so there is inaudible. So what we might want to do, I had asked, you know, we've got to evaluate this, and right or not, and if necessary, try to procure the sand, put the sand in first, then the water. Female participant. This is what we came up with. We have a NUREG that inaudible says that, that this is what we've had. That's not new information. That's, and let me remind you folks, let me cut in here. NUREG is a series of manuals, is my understanding, that the NRC and other people can refer to. I don't have access to all their NUREG manuals. Maybe they're logged somewhere. I just don't know where they're at. But in these manuals are kind of the physics and the calculations of if, then. Okay, if something happens, then what are the results? And they kind of go in and try and give you an idea. They'll say if there's a station blackout, prolonged, and you have no cooling, it's X number of hours before you have this particular effect, breach of containment, uh, Y number of hours before the spent fuel pool runs dry, and you have a Zerk fire, so on and so forth. That's what these NUREG manuals are, to my best understanding. Okay, to continue from the document. Male participant, right. Female participant. Also, what our fire people have been telling us every day, saying that male participant, the key word is, Female participant, this is analysis that we did for decommission of the spent fuel pool. And that was what the answer was, sand. And it's not like male participant. And it's not like there's not sand around there that inaudible. Male participant, yes, probably inaudible. But our reactor safety people have to come up with a decision about yes or no. Male participant, well, yeah. I mean, if you guys are doing this and we're and then we're saying sand is the right thing, then maybe... Male participant, well, no, no, it's not sand. Female participant, this is in the interim. Male participant, it's sand, then water. Female participant, then water. Male participant, and what inaudible is that? Male participant, and it's what we've said. Female participant, we've been saying it for three days that we need to get sand. Male participant, over top. Female participant, over top because it smothers it and provides shielding. You know, all male participant. Have we heard back from the folks over in Japan about that? Inaudible. Checking back in the log to see if there's any male participant. When we left this morning, Moniger had gone to meet with Inaudible at TEPCO to talk about the Inaudible after we left shift Inaudible. Female participant. 
That was the list we put together at 6.30. Male participant, right. Female participant, this morning. Male participant. So you know what? You understand what? Female participant, sand, clay. Male participant, project. Male participant, right. Female participant, sand. Male participant, exactly. Male participant. And if it's sand, then you've got to get the sand there. Male participant. And we actually scanned an email from that one page out of the NUREG that female participant right. Male participant, all of that stuff. Female participant right. Our NUREGs are inaudible, that option. We sent that to them at 6.30 yesterday. Male participant. Sent that to who? F male participant. Sent that to Moniger to go with his meeting with, with TEPCO. Female participant. Yes. Male participant. Okay. But what is surprising is we were on a phone call with them. And they were saying water, not sand. Female participant. I'm just telling you what our recommendation was yesterday at 6.30 was sand. That's what? Male participant. It sounds like you need to get on the phone with them and hash this out. Male participant. That's why. That's part of why I'm asking for information because. Male participant. Hash it out with the people in country. Male participant. Yes. Female participant. Okay. Male participant. With Moniger and Altson. Phonetic, it says, Altson, and male participant. The going in question was Moniger had called us up and said, quote, we're going to meet with them in 45. We're leaving in 45 minutes, end quote. Female participant, right. Male participant, quote, and what they've told us is, end quote, and that's where we got that unit four was dry, was from that conversation, and that this was, you know, you've got a dry pool again, no water. Female participant. And we call back to NRRs and Audible. As a matter of fact, I think we called all of them. We robo-dialed them yesterday, and every single one of them, the first thing that came out of their mouth was, quote-unquote, sand. And that's also consistent with NUREG 1333. That's the manual I'd like to see, ladies and gentlemen. NUREG 1333, which we have, but it specifically deals with disasters for spent fuel pools. I mean... I like that analysis, but that's not telling us anything we don't already know. Male participant. And we use this as confirmation. Female participant. Right. Male participant. Well, the question is, it's great that we're working on these pumps in the water and boron get somebody working on sand. Male participant. Right. Japanese. Inaudible. Female participant. That was our next inaudible is call and male participant. And you need to get sand. Okay, and that's where I stop on this reading. And I want to back up just a little bit here. Let me scroll back up my screen. I want to read that to you again. Male participant. He's, he's referring to John Moniger's statement. He's spoken with John Moniger. They've heard him on the phone. And Moniger is embedded with TEPCO officials. He's very close in. He, he's hands-on hearing it directly from the TEPCO guys. So this call is in question. What Moniger's telling them is going to a meeting and, and here's what's going on. He says, the going in question was Moniger had called us up and said, we're going to meet with him in 45, TEPCO and other officials, and we're leaving in 45 minutes. Female participant, right. Male participant. And what they've told us is, quote, he's referring to Moniger saying this, and what they've told us is, and then this guy goes on to say, and that's where we got that unit four was dry, was from that conversation. And that this was, you know, you've got a dry pool again, no water. So that's what this whole thing is about. They know that pools run dry early on. This is the 17th. They're delaying. They're, they're stalling. They're dragging feet because these guys are like, hey, we need to get sand. What are we doing? Let's acquire the sand. If we're going to do sand, let's get to work on it, you know, because time is of the essence here, folks. So I certainly hope you see, again, this is clear indication consistent with everything else we've seen. You know, for ran dry, and not only ran dry, but it was damaged to the extent that they're not just kind of considering sand. This is pretty much a you know, looks to me like they're definitely going to do sand. And it seems to me like the process is, I'd like to read this NUREG 1333 manual, but it seems to me you fill it with sand and chunks of lead, and then slowly you add water. There is plenty of discussion in these documents that if you just pour water on that heated fuel on that pile of rubble, you're going to have an incredible source term. In other words, an incredible emission of radioactivity will be released. So this NUREG manual is kind of giving them advice. Now, there's covers over these pools now, and I put it to you, they could have debunked me a long time ago. They could have debunked Hattrick Penry on this one a long time ago. Of course, I'd be happy if they did. 
Uh, that would be great news to know they really are removing the fuel out of Unit 4. But I just have seen zero zip indication of that in these documents at all. John Moniger, embedded with TEPCO, is giving us the straight dope, as they like to say it these days, the, the truthful, accurate information directly from TEPCO. Fact. Okay. Now, throughout this reading, I'll be flashing some TEPCO pictures of the damage of the units at Fukushima. That's uh, appreciation to Miss Milky the Clown who posted up a link to that. I was able to go in and grab some really uh, nice visual uh, pictures for you guys to really look at and just get an idea of the colossal scale of damage, the uh, you know irretrievable level of damage at Fukushima. When you consider a 46 foot tall wall of water slammed into the facility and I found evidence in these emails where they discussed that fact that TEPCO measured a 46-foot-tall watermark on the Unit 2 building. Okay, we're looking at a document now that is from Sunday, March 20th, 2011. Sunday, March 20th, 2011. This is, I'm reading this one because recently, as you guys know, I'll include a link to this story. This case of the Navy sailors has been thrown out of court as they're trying to sue TEPCO. I have multiple documents that indicate Navy, NRC, some of our guys may have been involved in a little bit of a cover-up and the new conditions were much worse, but downplayed, bungled modeling, intentionally uh, downplayed modeling and left our sailors in harm's way when they knew they should have moved them further distance out of the way. And the fact they got sick kind of proves it, okay? So this document right here, please read it in its entirety. There's a lot to take out of it. I just want to read you this one section and kind of give you a feel for how they don't want to move Navy ships. They know if they have to move a bunch of these ships out of the way to the degree that they should, it would be absolutely indicative as to the severe nature of this particular accident and the fact they knew it this early on. Okay, So remember that any real major warning or alert in the United States any real movement of Navy ships out of the way to any degree would have been very much indicative of the true nature and true status of Fukushima after the tsunami. Okay, from the document. Marty Virgilio. Hey, sorry to bother you. And Charlie's on the line, too. Charlie Miller. Hey, Mike. Mike Weber. Hi, Charlie. Marty Virgilio. Based on my discussions this afternoon, as I was coming in with the chairman's office, and Josh Baskin in particular, Josh has expressed, on behalf of the chairman, an interest that we engage at a high level, and I'm thinking that's either the office of the director or a DO level at a White House hosted meeting tomorrow at 8.30 to discuss what are or what should be the assumptions that we're using for the calculations on, on consequence. And I just wanted to, Mike Weber, in terms of the source terms or the Marty Virgilio, yeah, and we've been working and I should mention now a source term in case you don't aren't familiar with that term, can be a source of radiation, a source of emanation of uh, radiation. So keep that in mind. If they say they're modeling on four source terms, it could be two reactors and two spent fuel pools or any combination thereof. But three source terms would be radiation emanating from three places. Two would be from two, one would be from one, so on and so forth. Mike Weber, in terms of the source terms or the Marty Virgilio, yeah. And we've been working for the last couple of shifts, just trying to figure out how to approach this. I think we've on an approach now where we're giving sort of a realistic worst case, given the situation in spent fuel two, spent fuel pools three and four, and then the bounding worst case, which could include reactors if things go wrong. Mike Weber, right. Marty Virgilio, redacted, redacted, redacted. And Don, read me the long list of people that are going to be there. Right now we're lined up to send a technical expert but the chairman's office is asking if we can, plus you know the technical experts, plus a senior level management, to go nose to nose with Aoki on a position that we believe is the right position in initial conditions and assumptions for the analysis. Let me let John give you just a little bit more of what we're doing on the approach. John, hi Charlie, Mike, Charlie Miller, good evening, Marty Virgilio. We've been in this ongoing back and forth where we've had, dare I say, criticism, I'm trying to be nice, some real angst apparently by folks about what went into the source term, why we made that assumption, and while we have tried to patiently explain it back and forth, there seems to be at least still some mixing of what we did as a realistic worst case 
which has some of reactor 2, all of spent fuel 4, and half of spent fuel 3 in order to try to do our protective action. That was the base for the press release that went out on Wednesday. Okay, that's important. That particular scenario was the base of the press release that went out earlier in the week on Wednesday. This particular document is from the March 20th. Okay, so and on that initial one assessment that went out in a press release, he's saying some of reactor two, all of spent fuel four, half of spent fuel three, in order to try to do their protective action. He goes on to say, this is Marty Virgilio, and then what our answer was, redacted, 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 which was we nicknamed the melt core setup, which included contributions from reactors one, two, three, and all four of the spent fuel pools. Now every shift that I'm coming here, I keep thinking I'm going to be told that NARAC, and they do the modeling, you give them the source terms and they send you back the modeling, I'm going to be told that NARAC will have run the melt core worst case model, redacted, redacted, for the transatlantic calculation to see what the deposition might be in the United States. And every time I come in here, they're asking us questions and they haven't run it yet. Jim Weber, G, Marty Virgilio. While we have been in the TA bridge until a little while ago, my folks back in the protective measures team have been engaged in yet another conversation. And I don't know where it actually stands at this moment. But the call that, the meeting tomorrow is to talk about, big block redaction, redacted, redacted. DOD wants to know where to move their ships. EPA and others want to know what to expect on the West Coast. HHS wants to know what kind of levels in order to make recommendations on whether or not they should actually recommend potassium iodide at some point. And it goes sort of on and on. Redacted, redacted, redacted. I would hope that a success would be that in the end there is a, an audible agreement high enough up that my folks wouldn't continue to bang their heads against the telephone back and forth with folks at our level about what assumptions are and they would actually do some calculations for us in other words quit trying to figure out how many source terms maybe it's two maybe it's three maybe it's four but and just we need to come to a conclusion the longer you delay the longer you drag on these emanations have been ongoing now this plume by the 20th has already reached our coast obama's in south america right now with stephen chu and his family remember this folks remember this forget not that I sent this information out to many alternative sites at the time, and I even tried to write an article that Intel Hub wouldn't publish that said this was Obama's Achilles heel, Plumegate. If it was made public to enough of a degree, it could have cost him the election, his re-election chances, okay? In these documents, just the most incredible evidence, folks, eye-opening evidence. Hey, maybe not a single person ever goes to jail for this, okay? But... We learn everything we can about what they're doing, their methods, their strategy, how they operate. And at least we're not fools. At least we're not stupid. At least we're not ignorant. Does that make sense? Okay, let me go back to what I was after this redaction. I would hope that a success would be that in the end, there is an inaudible agreement high enough up that my folks wouldn't continue to bang their heads against the telephone back and forth with folks at our level about what assumptions are. And they would actually do some calculations for us. That's the model of success was exactly what was communicated to me by Josh from the chairman. Mike Weber, Marty, have we, has anybody spoken to Steve? Marty Virgilio, Aoki? No, not since, not, I don't know when the last time Aoki has been a couple of the calls that we have been on from the protective measures team area as we have explained what we were doing and the process that we were going through. Mike Weber. And Don, redacted, 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 Marty Virgilio, we have provided him at least three and four times that I've been personally involved in. Charlie Miller, Mike, redacted, redacted, Mike Weber, redacted, redacted, Charlie Miller, yes. Mike Weber, so he knows about that request. Charlie Miller, right. Now, but as I remember, he was, he was waffling on what they wanted him to do there. Waffling is not the right word. He seemed to have angst about doing that. So maybe that's what's holding this up. I don't know. Mike Weber. Yeah, yeah. Marty Virgilio. Big block redaction. Redacted, redacted. Marty Virgilio says, can we just get one worst case and put it on the shelf? Marty Virgilio. Right, right. Charlie Miller. Right? Marty Virgilio. Right. 
Charlie Miller. And if something's changed and that's not what they want, okay. But we all need to be aligned on what it is we're trying to achieve. Mike Weber. When was the last time we spoke to Steve? John? Marty Virgilio. Steve may well have been on the call that my protective measures team folks have been on for the last hour. Marty Virgilio. Oh, okay. John, he was on the email that set up that call that started at 7.30. I've been in here with the ET executive team as we did the press and the TA brief, so I have not had a chance to find out from my folks what the latest was in that phone call. Charlie Miller, if, if you're getting angst about moving naval ships and things like that, the worst case scenario isn't necessarily the one you want to run. Marty Virgilio, right, Charlie. This is what we're all thinking, that there's, you know, you run at least two cases. Okay, I'm going to stop the reading on that particular sentence right there. And as you can clearly see, just that last little bit really sums it up. It really sums it up. I suspect there's a high level of negligence, maybe even an actual active cover-up. And if you look at these documents, what the feel you get from it is they, they, don't, they just don't want to move Navy ships. It doesn't matter what reality is. It doesn't matter what the real assumptions are or the source terms or being realistic. They just don't want to move the ships. They just want Obama to be able to say harmless levels. And in order to do that, you have to play with the modeling. You have to subvert it, downplay it, intentionally bungle it, delay modeling. I've got a whole list of ways you can you can cheat and get around that. And that's what they did. I've proven this in my book. Something wicked this way comes, completely free to everybody. Okay, that brings an end to another HP News Network special report. I appreciate you joining me. This is Patrick Penry, over and out. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.